Pastor, what would you say about Christians with credit cards? Doesn't the Bible say, oh, no, man? Many call themselves Christians, but they go around using others and holding on to their money while making others suffer. I want these so-called Christians to hear the answer to this question and to learn and share. It will please God, I believe, and thank you. Well, I, I don't know if my answer will be what you expect. I have a credit card. You see, there, this is good counsel to avoid debt, of course. But most of us today have to acquire the things we need on some kind of installment plan. And that is not dishonest. It is not the fact that you buy on installment plan. It is when you refuse to keep your word and pay according to your promise that you do wrong. And so credit cards are a blessing. As a matter of fact, they give us cards to use from our office so that you don't have to keep carrying a lot of money with you. So it's not really wrong to have a credit card. The problem is when you refuse to keep your word and pay according to the contract. And, and honestly, I don't see how that causes anybody else to suffer as long as a Christian keeps his word. Thank you. Pastor, here's an interesting question. Why do so many of the women in your church dress so plainly? <laughs> I, told, uh, I told Pastor Ortiz I was going to have to have some time with this. Because I imagine I have had 15 or 20 questions about how a Christian ought to dress. And I said, perhaps we won't answer so many questions tonight. We'll just deal with this one. Is that all right? Now, I want you to jot down the references I give you because uh, you will want to settle this in your heart. Once and for all, and I want to tell you something, God never sends his truth to embarrass or to offend, but to enlighten. Is that all right? Now, the first text I want you to write down is Proverbs 8 and verse 13. There the Bible says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil and pride and arrogancy. If you want to really fear the Lord, then you learn to hate evil and to hate pride and arrogancy. A Christian is not to be a proud person. Write down Proverbs 6 and verse 16. There the Bible says six things God hates, yea, seven are an abomination, and the first is pride. What is it? Pride. Don't forget these texts, and there are many others like that. Now sin began in heaven, and it is a mystery. If it could be explained, it could probably be accepted. But it is a mystery. It was totally uncalled for. But when we consider the history of sin, we find a perfect God in a perfect heaven with a perfect angel in a perfect environment with perfect company. Are you with me? Now, how on earth could sin begin in an atmosphere like that? Well, I want to tell you that pride very well could be called the father of sin. The first sin. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, the Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, and then it goes on to tell us what those things are. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And then the next verse says, the world passeth away. So beloved, a Christian 
who is a Christian is by nature a humble person who subdues and conquers pride. These texts are very clear. Now you really don't have to learn pride. It seems we are born with it. Pride is a great evil and God names it number one amongst the seven which to him are an abomination. Now God has a program to mitigate pride. And we who know God's word enter into God's program and we fight against pride in our lives by obedience to God's standards. Would you say amen out there? And don't ever consider anything that God does to be insignificant or unnecessary. God has an arrangement with his people to help them overcome pride and arrogance, say, until this world has passed away. I want to tell you right now, when we get to heaven, we're going to wear gold on our heads crowns of gold with stars in the crown. Would somebody say amen? There is no sin in things. Sin is in people. And God has a system that helps us fight against that. Now let me just cover several things while I'm in it. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. I came to demonstrate in my life and teachings what real obedience is all about. And Jesus said, you have heard it said, that if a man murder his brother or kills his brother, he's a murderer. I say unto you, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. So Christ is enlarging. Amen. And amongst other things he said, you have heard that if a man commits adultery with a woman, he has done this awful sin. But I say unto you, if you look at a woman to lust after her, you have committed adultery already in your heart. Now Christians ought not to have any trouble saying amen to that. Now the reason I picked that out is because God wants Christian women to dress in a way that does not invite lust all right now the bible rule is not inches but it is a principle called modesty i was down in a foreign land once and i noticed all the ladies that i uh, seemed to recognize had on funny looking dresses they they were not long enough to be long and not short enough to be normal and i okay if that's what they want to wear it's all right me and so uh, finally, uh, somebody began to ask me questions. How many inches should your dress be off the ground? And I said what I said now. God doesn't deal in inches. He deals in principles. And the principle is modesty. Christian women should be modest. Would you have a disagreement with that? Modest. And frankly, that's a relative term. If you are buxom, modesty for you might be different than for a very slender lady. God's principle is modesty in dress so that women do not become unnecessarily a temptation to men. Well, it didn't seem to satisfy some of the folk. And finally, I met the man responsible for it. He was teaching on that island that every dress had to be exactly nine inches off the ground. I thought it totally ridiculous. God doesn't deal in inches. You'd have to carry a ruler around all day and keep measuring because dresses ride up. But while we disallow that kind of incredible foolishness, ladies and gentlemen, God expects men and women to be modest. And we are living in an immodest age. The designers of clothes are not necessarily Christian. They are commercial 
and if they make dresses this year, they got to change it for next year or else they can't make any money. So all of a sudden, immodesty is everywhere and it becomes the norm. And when you look around, their shoulders out, bosoms out, backs out, thighs out, toes out. Look out. This is an immodest age. And people's minds are obsessed with clothing and appearance. Some are even slaves to it. All the money they can get a hold of and that which they don't even have. Maybe that's what that question was about with these credit cards. Money they don't even have. They just have to buy, 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 buy. I tell you, it's not always easy to find the right thing because the trend is immodest. Now, I've got one of those darling wives that wants me to go shopping with her. I'll whisper to you all that I don't like to do that. I do it, but I don't like to do it because women shop funny. They'll walk your legs off and won't buy a thing. But I enjoy her company, so I go with it. Now, I'm something of an artist, and I appreciate texture and design. And sometimes while she's looking, I'm looking, and I'll see a color that I know will complement her lovely brown skin. And I'll go over and pull it off. And when I look at it, it dips all the way down. It has a slit all the way. There's no need asking her to try that on. Hang it up. It's immodest. Others may, she cannot. Not because she's my wife necessarily, but because she is a Christian. Now, when you say our ladies are plain, it generally holds that Christian ladies in our church do not burden themselves with superfluous jewelry. Now, please remember what I told you. God doesn't send the truth to embarrass you, but to enlighten you. And I wish you'd remember, too, my family wasn't born in this thing. We learned it just like you learned it. By listening to the word of the Lord and studying it out for ourselves. I want to read something to you. It, to me, it is very clear. I'm going to the book of Isaiah. What book did I say? And it's chapter 3. And I want you, by the way, I read from an archaeologist that Isaiah lived across the street from a beauty parlor. How did they know? Because they found Isaiah's house and directly across they found all kinds of pieces of broken mirror, combs, and pins. So the scholars conclude there was a beauty parlor across the street and Isaiah uh, took notice of this. I want you to listen. Isaiah chapter 3, and I'm beginning with verse 16. Now, I'm taking a little time. Write it down. The Bible says, Moreover, the Lord saith. Who saith? Don't you ever blame this on a denomination. Moreover, the Lord saith, Because the daughters of Zion. What is Zion? Church. The Lord saith, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty. They are what? That's a synonym for proud. Because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks. What does that mean? No need to rush it through this. It means they're so proud they got their noses in the air. They walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes. What does that mean? Trying to look sexy. You see how clear it is? The Lord says, because the daughters of the church are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go. Now, I want to be very frank and not indelicate in this company. Women are different than men. Praise the Lord. As girls enter into puberty, they become rounded and curvaceous and soft and they have wider hips to accommodate childbirth 
men generally become angular and in many cases broad-shouldered and so forth. They are different. God made them different. God intends that they be different. Now when a lady walks, normally and naturally, her walk is different than a man's walk. Automatically, because of the way she is built. But have you ever noticed how some, when they get on a dress that's sufficiently tight and revealing, they actually, they, 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 their walk is no longer normal. It is exaggerated. Now, I'm trying to be careful, but you understand me, don't you? The Bible says, walking and mincing as they go and making a tinkling with their feet. Verse 17, therefore the Lord, who will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. What does that mean? It's a reference, the commentaries say, to social diseases which follow in the trail of immodesty. The Lord will discover their secret parts. In that day, verse 18, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their coals and their round tires like the moon, the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers, the bonnets and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings and what? The rings, verse 21, and nose jewels. In our country now, you see people push holes in their noses and wear little studs. And nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel and the mantles and the whipples and the crisping pins and the glasses and the fine linen and the hoods and the veils. And all of these in that culture had a meaning and many of these things are in our culture and God says these are superfluous adornings and they exacerbate the problem of pride amongst God's people. And the Bible says in that day, referring to the day of judgment, God will snatch it away. Now this is not the only reference. In the book of Genesis 35 and verse 2, when Jacob's family was traveling and trouble began to follow them, they were told to put away their strange gods. And in verse 4, it says, And Jacob, or rather they gave Jacob all of their strange gods and all of their earrings in their ears. And they were hidden under an oak. God got rid of that so that he could come to the defense of his people. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when Moses went up in the mountain to commune with God, they heard a noise in the valley, and God broke off communications. He told Moses, go get thee down, for thy people that thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. And Moses said, Lord, let not thine anger wax hot against thy people. You see it? God said to Moses, look, these are your people. Moses said, no, Lord, they're your people. You know, when you corrupt yourself, nobody wants you. Would you say amen out there? And when Moses came down, he found them bowing down and worshiping a golden calf. Now these folk had just come out of Egypt. So they decided to dress up like the Egyptians did. And they loaded themselves with jewelry and they were immodest. The Bible says they played with all their might. And in the original says, leaping and dancing. They learned how to dance in Egypt. That's where the belly dance came from. And God was ready to destroy them. And Moses began to intercede for them. And finally, God had mercy. After the golden calf was destroyed, a judgment came and many, many of them died. Not only that, the firstborn lost the privilege of priesthood. It was given to the Levites. And now God's anger began to go away. And God said that they were to take off their ornaments. Are you listening? God says, take off your ornaments that I might know what to do with you. This is found in Exodus 33 
And the Bible says they stripped themselves by Horeb. They took them off. In a time of judgment, at a time when they were in danger of being judged forever, it was necessary in order to please God to take this off. We are living in the time of the judgment. Would somebody say amen? It is time for us to look like what we profess to be. One man said, if you believe in the Redeemer, you ought to look redeemed. Now we're going on. Bible tells us, uh, I don't have time to go through them all. You ask some questions, I'll give you some more. But I want to go to the New Testament. What did I say? Because there are people who always want to give everything to the Jews and they want to get rid of everything they don't want to do by saying that's the Old Testament. Well, I'm going to the New. And the Bible says this in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. I want you to listen. This is the New Testament. And the Bible says in verse 9 of chapter 2 of 1 Timothy, In like manner also that women adorn themselves, adorn means dress, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Would you say amen? Now that's been in the Bible all these centuries. It isn't God's fault that you don't know it. John Wesley, the father of Methodism, and I was a Methodist, John Wesley said not one cent should be spent on superfluous adornings and gildings. That was the teaching of the Methodist Church. In fact, many of the things you've heard out here were taught by the early reformers. But as the churches have kept turning away from God's law, they have adopted a lifestyle that even their founders did not approve of. And that's what John Wesley taught. The New Testament says that we ought to dress as women professing godliness, that's verse 10, not with gold or pearls or costly array. Now I'm going over to the book of 1 Peter. What book did I say? Chapter 3, please listen. 1 Peter chapter 3, and I'm beginning with verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. And the word conversation in the Greek means conduct. Are you with me? While they behold your chaste conversation or conduct, coupled with fear, verse 3, Who's adorning dressing? Who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women, what kind of women? The holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves. Now this is the New Testament, beloved. God sends truth to enrich us. I want to conclude this. I don't have time to give you everything. But I want to conclude this by telling you that what we are to avoid in our appearance is artificiality. There's nothing wrong with being attractive. As a matter of fact, there's a difference between being attractive and being beautiful. A person can be attractive without being beautiful. I'm a, I'm a connoisseur of beauty in women. And as an authority, I want to tell you, I have never seen an ugly woman. They make themselves ugly by their attitude. On the other hand, I have seen some handsome women who were ugly because they were so snooty. They made you feel like you owed them a debt just to look at them. What makes a woman attractive? I'll give you some hints. A beautiful smile, a clear conscience, a friendly attitude, a Christian demeanor. You can be attractive and people enjoy 
being around you without your being beautiful. Amen? Now, if you are beautiful, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you aren't, just keep yourself clean, well-groomed, and love Jesus so much that he shines through your countenance. And people will find you attractive and will beat a path to your door. Finally, there are some things that are classified jewelry which are utilitarian. A watch is one of those things. Uh, it, it serves a purpose. And there are other such things. Uh, there are some people who stumble over everything. I don't try to make everything wrong. You see, the, there are Pharisees amongst us who think you shouldn't even wear a tie pin. I got a little tiny tie pin. The reason I got it is so when I'm preaching, my tie won't dance to and fro so that you will notice my tie rather than listening to what I got saying. So those things which are useful, utilitarian, generally are acceptable as long as you don't go to extremes. It would be wrong for me to spend $10,000 for a diamond tie tag. Would you say amen? And you can rest assured, I don't do that. Now this one was given to me by a fine man who's sitting here now. I maybe he paid 10000 Maybe he'll tell me he did. But I can tell you when I buy one, it doesn't cost that. Now, you see how reasonable God's program is? And when you first put on lipstick, you feel so self-conscious because it's unnatural. When you first do a lot of things, you feel that way because it's unnatural. We were not born with purple fingernails. It's unnatural. Keep your fingernails polished and clean and clear and, and shined up and clipped and shaped. But you don't need black fingernails. They got fingernails now with palm trees on them. And mountains and sunsets. You don't need that. Amen? There ought to be a difference when you look at a Christian lady than when you look at one who isn't. And God said there would be a difference amongst the people because of him. And as an as an expert on beauty, I want to tell you, you don't need it. You don't need it. Only the enemy makes you think you do. And once you've been used to it for a while, you feel a little funny until you get used to not having it on. That's why the ladies in our church who are faithful look plain. But don't they look good? <laughs> I've been married to a beautiful woman for a long time. And even though we're getting older, she's still beautiful. She is to me, and you better believe it. And as we get older still, she'll be beautiful. And she has never had to depend on those things. How many of you appreciate that answer to the Lord's, the Lord's answer to your question? If you do, say amen. amen. Oh, true. 
and bold, bright as the saints, we know him for of old.